I'm Stacy Houle. Like we said, I'm one of the staff pastors here at Living Word, and I was thinking about how long I've been on staff. I love that, you know, Charlie's always been in a more visible position than I've been in. So most people think that, you know, I came along after him, but the reality is I've been on staff here for 19 years. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's funny because when I actually took the position, I was like, okay, I'm going to be on staff for two years, and then I'm going to move to X, Y, Z, and then I'm going to move on to this and move on to that. And obviously, God had another plan for me, and I'm so thankful that he did. Um, and I was thinking about it. I started out here as a graphic designer, and I was thinking about all the different places that I served. I started out in Holy Grounds uh, when it was um, the coffee shop, when it was in the atrium. Then I served in, I think, almost every age of children's ministry up till about six years old. And gosh, where else did I serve? I, I think I wrote them down. The info counter, I was completely dysfunctional there because by that point, Charlie and I knew way too many people, so I did not stay behind that counter for more than like 30 seconds. So the people that we served with did not like that at all. It was pretty annoying. Where are Charlie and Stacy? They are not back here. So that didn't work very well. We started serving at Marriage Matters. Um, I served at a group called Life After Work and Girls of Grace, and obviously all of this was long before Charlie and I started leading some of these groups, so it's really fun. If you have never gotten involved and served in a ministry here, I would highly encourage you to. It's just an awesome way to connect with people, awesome way to let God move in your life. I wasn't planning to say that, but I just want to encourage you because it's been a blessing to both Charlie and I. You know, um, one of the things I've realized, though, over the years is I'm actually, believe it or not, way more comfortable behind the scenes. And over the last six months, I realized that I was getting a little too comfortable like hiding out, I kind of said that the last three months have been my cave season. So when that phone call came on Monday, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Nope, nope, I'm not picking up a microphone again. But the Lord was like, yeah, actually you are. It's time. And I told some of my friends, you know, I grew up riding horses. And so I felt the Lord say, nope, it's time for you to get back into the saddle. And so that's, where I, that's what I'm doing. That's where I am. Um, but one of the funny stories for me about like how much more comfortable I am in the back, um, in the back behind the scenes than I am up front. Three weeks after I took over Girls of Grace, um, I had one of my teaching team speaking that morning and I went in the back to hang out with my small group that I had led for so many years. And when we were supposed to start that morning, I'm like, why is no one starting this thing? And I kind of went, oh my gosh, <laughs> because it's supposed to be me. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm leading, and I, I was very comfortable just hanging out in the back with the girls. So I think God always has a sense of humor, and I love that about him. Um, do you guys mind if I tell, if I start with a couple more stories? I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of like stories. I like to know who's talking to me. I like to connect with them, because I think we always kind of assume that we know somebody based on like what we see outward appearance and we don't really know how they got to that point. And so I want to tell you these things, number one, because it keeps me humble. <laughs> I like to tell on myself because, you know, and number two, I think all of us need a little more joy these days, right? And number three, because I think it gives people hope. I mean, too often I think we think everyone else's life is all together right? And we're the only ones that have these crazy moments, um, these painfully awkward moments. And I don't know, I think we all have them. At least I know I do. So I want you to remember, you know, if she can do this, I can too. And I don't mean necessarily standing up here with a microphone, but whatever thing that God has been putting on your heart to do, whatever he's been kind of tugging at you to do that you think is maybe just a little bit bigger, than what you can do on your own. I just want you to know, you know what? God is big enough. If he's able to use me, one of his many foolish things, I believe that he is absolutely able to use you too. Okay, so I want to go back, gosh, is this 10 or 11 years? The first time Charlie and I were asked to share announcements at Marriage Matters. It was in here. There were a couple hundred people. Um, that's all, just sharing announcements. I don't know if any of you were in here that night. Maybe you'll jog your mind. <laughs> Scott's waving from the sound booth. He was in here. I would not speak. So Charlie and I are standing up here, supposed to give announcements. I would not even say my name. 
And at one point, he hands me the microphone. He's like, honey, do you have anything to add? And I just stared at him. I don't know how he didn't like get laser beams through his forehead, but I was so mad at him, all right? So then the next time, a couple weeks later, a month later, we were supposed to share the announcements again. And that time I was like, okay, I looked so stupid last time. I'm gonna say something this time. So I had him print out the announcements two days ahead of time. I practiced for two days. I was still a hot mess when I took that microphone, but I did speak, all right? Can you imagine that? I think I'm just, anyway, it was, you're not laughing with me, but it was pretty, it, it was pretty embarrassing, and I was so mad at Charlie. Thankfully, we're, we're still okay. We're still together. I've forgiven him, I think. Um, then, fast forward, probably a year later, Pastor Tim and Renee Burt, who were co-leading the group with us, we were kind of, again, doing everything behind the scenes. They were kind of more up front. They, they said, okay, now it's time for you guys to speak. <sighs> again, I'm not happy about this, right? So Pastor Tim is standing down there because their social distancing wasn't a thing. We didn't care about anybody's spit at that time. <laughs> so we could stand on the floor. This is, this is weird for me being up here. And I was probably sitting where Lisa is sitting, and Pastor Tim starts introducing us. And it was an awesome moment when we stood up because we thought, you know, we're going to come up front. He's like, no, I'm not done with you yet. And he's like, sit back down. Well, Charlie just sat right back down in his seat. And can anybody imagine what I did? My seat folded up. So I sat down, but I sat down all the way to the floor. <laughs> and so then I'm like trying to like, I'm, I'm dying laughing, okay? And I'm a silent laugher, so I'm just crying, laughing. And I'm trying to figure out how to wiggle myself into the chair without anybody noticing. I can't even imagine what the people behind me were thinking or doing. I don't, I don't know. But again, like I said, I mean, the Lord uses the foolish things, doesn't he? Okay, and then I finally got to the point where I thought I had it all together. I actually showed up for Marriage Matters one night. I looked cute. You know, it was when those belts, you wore the belts over the top of your shirt, and I felt like I finally figured it out that night. I had everything. I felt, I felt good. I looked good. And I got home that night to realize that I'd worn my shirt backwards. <laughs> all night... And I kept, all night, I was like, what is wrong? And I kept kind of tugging at it and kind of, well, what was wrong was that that was not the front of my shirt. That was supposed to be the back of the shirt. So, again, I completely understand why the Bible says that God uses the fool, or when uh, the Bible says that God uses the foolish things. And I love 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31 in the message translation. It says, Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see any of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chooses these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies, that makes it quite clear that none of you get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. Amen. You know, I think so often we look at leadership and we think that leadership has it all together. That, you know, these people are just awesome. And we look at the Bible, we have all these um, uh, Bible heroes, our heroes in the faith. And sometimes we forget that they were human too, right? But if you read the word and you read, kind of read into it, think about what they were experiencing in that moment, we know that they made a whole lot of mistakes, that they stumbled a whole lot of times. And honestly, Gideon, you know, is one of my personal favorites because over and over, you know, in the Bible, we see how God believed in people that didn't believe in themselves, right? And when you look at that story of Gideon in Judges 6, 11, we find that he's threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press and he's hiding the grain from the Midianites, right? Right? 
So then in verse 12, the angel of the Lord appears to him and he calls him out and he says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And I think Gideon's response in verse 13 is like so real because he responds, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Can't you just hear him? Like, God, if you're there, why did you let this happen? You'd think that this happened in 2020, wouldn't you? (laughs) All right. And he says, and where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. I mean, can you imagine responding that way to God? Like, you're not with us. What are you talking about? You abandon us. You know, I think after the last 10 months that our family has had, I think I can imagine a little bit better, you know, how Gideon was feeling, some of the thoughts that he had, like, where are you, God? I know you're here, but where are you? But I love God's response because you know what? He basically ignores all of Gideon's complaints, right? And he doesn't defend himself. God doesn't say, no, I've been here all the time. You just didn't see me. You know, he doesn't say any of those things because I love that about God. He lets truth defend itself. So then when we look at verse 14, he simply says, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. You know, Gideon was expecting God to do something. And God's like, no, I'm sending you. I've got you. But Gideon wasn't done complaining yet. How many of you have ever been called by God to do something and you've had a few excuses before you were ready to walk forward in that plan? Okay, I'm glad it's not just me. I see a couple hands and a couple nods. Like, you get it. So um, in verse 15, he said, But Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. My favorite for this verse is actually the message where Gideon says, I'm the runt of the litter. I mean, just think about that. I don't know. In verse 16, the Lord simply responds, I'll be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Okay, then we go on in the next six verses, Gideon is still trying to get God to prove himself. Like, okay, if it's really you, Lord, do this, do that. In verse 22, he finally realizes, oh, it is you, Lord. Now, you know what? Now I'm doomed because I've seen you face to face. But then he quickly goes back again and is like, if, you, if it's really you, Lord, then I want a fleece, have it dry, have it wet. You know, he's just all the drama. <laughs> We think that we have drama. You know, some of the characters in the Bible, they had drama too. And I think, I don't know, I don't think God gets mad at us for it. I think he's kind of entertained. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to keep believing that. You know, and I don't know if these, some of these stories help you. I know that they help me. They help me to see just how gracious God is. Like just how merciful he is, how much he loves us in spite of our questions, in spite of our doubt, in spite of our unbelief. Because how many times have you asked God to prove himself? How many times have you been in a situation and God spoke to your heart and you said, really, Lord, is this you? Because I'm not sure. You know, God called me to homeschool our kids and I was like, "Uh uh-uh, nope, that is not you, Lord. Get behind me, Satan. I'm out of here. It took me a year and a half to obey, and I think he knew that. I think he knew it was going to take me a while, so he started working on my heart a little bit early because he knew I'd be a little slow with that one. You know, but think about it. Moses needed a burning bush, right? And how about, let's, um, what about Peter? I mean, he walked with Jesus for three years, and still when the pressure came on, where was he? He denied his Lord and Savior that he had gotten to physically walk with, that he ate with, that, you know, he prayed with. Can you imagine? You know, and and what did Jesus do? Did he say, nope, that's it. I'm done with you. Three strikes, you're out. No, he restored him. He restored him right back into fellowship with him. Doesn't it just make you thankful that we have such a gracious God? Such a loving God. Um, But I don't know about you, you know, I get distracted. (laughs) I get impatient. 
Like, God, why haven't you done this yet? You know, you spoke this to my heart. Why isn't this done? I get disappointed. Sometimes I get scared. Even though the Bible tells us, some people say 365 times, tells us not to fear because I'm with you. I've got you. Sometimes we get tired because we're trying to do so many things on our own and so many things in our own strength. And then when God asks us to do something that's just a little bit outside of our comfort zone or to do something that feels just a little too big, is it really you, Lord? Are you sure? And we tell him all the reasons why we're not qualified, you know, why we're not the right one for the job. You know, like I said, when I got the phone call Monday afternoon and, and I was like, yep, I know that I'm supposed to share. All afternoon, I spent Monday not studying, but trying to remind God why I wasn't qualified and remind my husband why, how many other people, you know, should be standing up here and sharing tonight. But I love that God is, again, he's just so gracious. He's like, no, it's not about you. Because the truth is, you know what, a lot of times it isn't about us in the first place. And that's okay. That's a good thing. God's got something that he wants to do in and through us. You know, I think God simply wants us to trust him. You know, just like Olivia standing up here and doing the offering tonight, I think part of that battle for her was just obedience. Just being willing to step up totally outside of her comfort zone. You know, not trying to figure it out. You know, maybe there's something that he's been trying to remind you about. You know, something that he's saying, I've got this. I've got you. You're in my hand. Trust me. It's not your battle. You know, maybe he's been reminding you to be still. Stop striving. Stop trying so hard. And to stop trying to do it all in your own strength. You know, I think more than anything, God wants us to just walk with him. Just walk with him. Just be with him and to rest in him. I think he's been whispering for weeks, months, maybe years, I've got a plan for you. I love you. I'm right here. But I think just like God's plan for Gideon and for David, you know, when David fought Goliath, God's plan for us sometimes looks so different than the plans that we make for ourselves, the plans that we think that he should have for us. You know, Gideon raised up an army of 32,000 men, the runt of the litter. <laughs> you know, the least qualified, the weakest in all of Israel. What did he do? He raised up an army of 32,000. You know, they were still hopelessly outnumbered, but I don't know, I think that's a pretty big number. I'm thinking that's like 11 times the size of the capacity of this sanctuary. But do you know what God said? Nope. That's too many. That's way too many. So they whittle it down to 10,000. And God says, nope, nope, still too many. So when God finally <laughs> let Gideon fight the battle, he had 300, 300 men to fight. Yeah. Why? Because it wasn't about Gideon. It wasn't about what he could do. It wasn't about how many guys he could pull together. It wasn't about what he could do in his own strength. In Judges 7, 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Think about that. We'd brag that we did it all on our own. I think sometimes when things come so easy, we get used to that easy. And we like that easy. We get used to that comfort. But I think sometimes God just likes to show off. And I mean this in the best possible way. But that often means that life isn't going to look exactly the way we're expecting it to look. So I want to rewind just a bit, all right? As I mentioned, you know, I talked about Girls of Grace Flourish, the women's group that I lead. Um, one of the things that we've done for years is that we have gotten a yearly theme. And in April of 2019, I'm trying to make sure I get my, um, communicate my timeline pretty well here. So a year and a half ago, I was already, we were just wrapping up that season and I, we were moving into the next season and I, I was ready to have my new theme for the year. So I asked God, I'm like, 
okay, Lord, I'm ready. Like, what's my theme for the year? And he just said to me, be still and know. And I said, okay, I'll wait. (laughs) And I waited. And then I asked again a couple weeks later, and again I heard, be still and know. I was like, okay, I'll wait. If you don't want to tell me, I'll I'll just hold out. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, he should be ready to tell me. I'm ready to hear. He should be ready to tell me. But he's like, no, be still and know. Well, then I asked him a third time, and guess what he said? Anybody figure it out? (laughs) Yeah, he said, be still and know. And my lightning fast mind finally engaged, and I went, oh, oh, that's my theme. I mean, you guys got it way quicker than I did. But here's the problem for me. The problem was that that was the last battle plan that I would have chosen for myself. Because I'm a doer. I like to get things done. I like to accomplish things. You know, I've found over the last year that I probably get too much of my value and my worth out of what I can accomplish, out of what I can do. Um, So before a year and a half ago, you know, my husband and I were talking about this. I've I've apologized a couple times over the last couple days as I was thinking this through. I don't think that be still was even a part of my vocabulary. Like, not even a little bit, all right? We were, like, talking about this a little bit. You know, we've actually joked in our house, like, why we have living room furniture. Why do we have living room furniture? We don't use it. We don't actually sit down. Okay, maybe a little bit more now, but it took practice. (laughs) Our furniture is 18 years old, and if you come in my house, you'll be like, what? Are you kidding me? We've had teenagers, toddlers, teenagers again in that in that family room, and the furniture is still practically brand new. It should not surprise me because we don't sit on it very much because, again, we don't, we don't be still so good. Um, okay, and I realized from the time I was little, you know, I'd rather be moving, always moving, doing something, building something, drawing something, dancing, doing cartwheels in front of the TV when my family wa- tried to watch it. They loved it. They get so annoyed with me. You know, <laughs> I had said this, and my Aunt Olivia was like, no, that's real. I don't even like to slow down long enough or sit long enough to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Like, I just, I don't know. I have a problem. And, um, but here God was having me lead this group of 150 women, and he was telling me that my theme was supposed to be be still and know. I'm like, are you sure? I think you've got the wrong girl here for sure. And when we kicked off that year, I actually told the girls, I said, okay, I have to tell you, I don't only have ants in my pants, the ants in my pants have ants in their pants. Like, I just, I mean, you see, I'm like wandering up here, and I've got this chair, and I can sit down for about a couple seconds. But I never saw that as a problem. I actually thought it was one of my superpowers. I like wore it as a badge of honor. You know, the more productive I can be, the the more awesome I am. And I just thought it was great. If my family slept in on Saturday morning, I couldn't wait till they woke up to let them know how many loads of laundry I'd done, how many dishes I'd washed and put away, how many phone calls I'd made, how many emails I'd done, how many hours I'd spent doing graphic design. Like, I mean, can you see? Like, this was like how I lived. I didn't even hardly want to take time to breathe sometimes. Can you imagine living with me? (laughs) So much grace. Pray for my husband. I'm also a home, you know, I told you that I also am a homeschool mom. So I looked at every minute in our day as an opportunity to like teach them more, for them to learn. You know, there was always more to do. And again, I'm so thankful that they still like me. But here's the thing. Once I finally understood that be still and know was our theme for the year, I started seeing it everywhere. You know, have you guys noticed over the last year, I have seen that verse, Hobby Lobby, Target, you know, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere that theme has shown up on mugs, it's on, I have a bracelet, you know, it's just been everywhere on shirts, and Pastor Jamie, he's still been preaching on it a year later, you know, he was right along with me, we kind of were both on the same theme at the same time, and my favorite version of Psalm 4610 is the Passion Translation, because it says, surrender your anxiety. Be still and stop your striving, and you'll see that I'm God. I'm the God above all the nations, and I'll be exalted throughout the whole earth. And I had to hear this 
again and again. Stop striving. Stop trying so hard. Just rest. Trust me. And I have to keep hearing it again and again. So I did. I started making adjustments. I got a little bit better. You know, I'd take like 15 minutes and sit, on the, sit out on the deck. Sometimes I wouldn't even bring a book or a notebook. Every once in a while, I'd leave them, and I'd go out there with no agenda. And, you know, God started working on me and working in me, and he's still been working in me because how many of you know we're all a work in progress? It's just continual. You know, we have to continually renew our minds. And it's been a year, hasn't it? 2020. I don't want it. Well, I don't know. I don't want to do over. I'm, the best is yet to come. We're going to finish strong. And I've just realized how much I needed to be able to be still and how much I needed to trust him and how much I needed to be able to be still and trust that he was God, that he was God over all the strife, over all the division, over all the chaos and confusion, you know, and to remember that he's still the God of comfort. He's still our God of peace over all the loss and over all the tragedy that so many of us have experienced this year. And he's still the God that heals. Right, Russ? He's still the God that heals. No matter what health battle we're walking through. And I've realized that if I would have hit last November, okay, God sets us up, right? He knows what we need way before we need it, always. If I'd hit some of the speed bumps that were coming for me, like last November, some of you know what's, what happened, some of you don't, it doesn't necessarily matter. But if I'd hit November going at full throttle and at my typical breakneck pace, you guys, there's no way I could have handled the impact. Because if you don't know, I wasn't going to share this. I'm sorry, honey, I'm sharing it again. Some of you know, Charlie had a stroke last November, and our life came to a screeching halt. You know, and I... Still, again, God was so good in that moment and in that time. You know, our doctors spoke faith over us, peace over us. You know, we walked out of that hospital thinking like, okay, they told us six months to a year. We heard two weeks. <laughs> you ever done that, get a doctor's report? They tell you, oh, it's going to be, you know, two weeks to heal, six weeks to heal. And we walked out, we're like two weeks. But God was so gracious. We've done so well. But can you imagine if I had still been going at this crazy pace, his grace, right? And if I had gone into 2020 without, if I had walked into this year without that deep, unwavering trust and belief that God is who he says he is, that he is so good, you know, I don't know if I could have kept going these past six months because it feels like the enemy has not let up in any area. He's just kept that pressure on. And if we don't take time to trust God, to spend time with him, you know, I didn't know that those four words and that one verse was going to be so important to prepare me for the battles that I had coming. You know, the speed bumps that were still up ahead. I didn't understand that God's battle plan was perfect. It was exactly what I needed, even though it didn't fit into my plans. It wasn't what I thought I needed. You know, I realize I still have a long way to go before I get to, like, before I can stop being Martha and before I'm able to fully embrace sitting at Jesus' feet, you know, without worrying about all of life's distractions and responsibilities. You know, again, it's still a work in progress. You know, I think there'll always be more things to do. Our people always want to eat again <laughs> and again. There's always bills to pay. There's always lawns to be mowed. There's always laundry to do and dishes to wash. Yet Jesus himself told Mary that she chose what was best, sitting at her master's feet and listening to God's heart. Do you guys know that we're in a battle? Let me ask you that again. Do you know that we're in a battle? We're in a battle. We're in a battle between truth and lies. 
We're in a battle between isolation and community. I mean, I think fellowship and community has taken one of the biggest hits in 2020. Like, Charlie and I are total people per people, people. We love people. Like, I haven't known how to be out in public because I have to touch you. I have to get my arms around you. Like, I don't know how to do this six-foot social distancing thing. I'm sorry. I know, you know, so I've actually, that's why I've called this season my cave season because I've just, like, stayed in my house. Well, not stayed in my house. I go for walks. I go outside. But I don't know how to be around people and not get my arms around you and love on you. You know, the enemy has just, I think, tried to cause us to be afraid of each other. And that's not God's plan. (laughs) There's a battle. You know, we're in a battle between unity and division. You know, God's plan is to bring us together as a body of Christ. The enemy's plan is to divide us and to distract us. There's a major battle going on between light and darkness. We see it in almost every area of life. But we have to remember who our real enemy is, right? It's not each other. It's not our family members. It's not our neighbors. It's a spiritual battle. We're, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. People aren't our enemy, no matter how nasty they get, no matter how they respond to us, no matter how they look at us in the grocery store, no matter what they say or do, they are not our enemy And what did God tell us to do with our enemies, right? Anyway, he said to pray for them, to love them. This is a spiritual battle, and I really think that God wants us to be prepared. But it's so hard to be prepared if we won't slow down enough to hear his voice. A year and a half ago, I couldn't slow down enough to go to the bathroom, let alone slow down enough to hear his voice his voice. You know, if we won't slow down and hear what he wants us to say or what he wants us to do in a moment, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss those little things that he's speaking to our heart. You know, I sent a girlfriend a text today and just said, hey, I'm thinking about you. You got this. She's homeschooling for the first time. I'm like, girl, I believe in you. She's like, thank you. And about two hours later, I got a note back. She's like, can I tell you how my day started? She's like, I really needed your text. You know, when we slow down enough, when we we remember that it's not about us, that God's got a bigger plan, and think about people, we can hear his voice and know who he wants us to reach out to, know who he wants us to send a text to, who he wants us to call. You know, if he wants us to say hi to a neighbor across the street and ask them how their day is, You know, I believe that God's got a unique plan for us in this time. And I think it may look different than we are expecting. And that's so okay. So I want to close quick by sharing something um, from Bob Goff's. It's from his Living in Grace, Walking in Love devotional. I love Bob Goff. He just has this, like, carefree way of looking at God. And I just love the title of this devotional. A friend sent this to me last month. It said, it always looks like evil is going to win right up until it doesn't. Isn't that the truth? It always looks like evil is going to win right up until it doesn't. And then it starts with John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Again, it always looks like evil is going to win right up until it doesn't. Just let that encourage you. You know, as you look around, no, nope, evil doesn't win. And then he goes on to say, when I was a boy, comic books came into the scene and started to get big. Characters like Spider-Man, Batman, and Wonder Woman lived in a world where evil popped up just in time for another episode. No matter which sinister villain seemed to be giving evil an edge, the hero was always more powerful than the obstacle in front of them. Evil has a way of looking like it's going to win right up until it doesn't. While these comic books were fantastical, every enduring story reminds us of a truth. Even when it seems like all hope has lost the lead, redemption 
is where the story is heading. Just before Jesus went away for a while, he told us we'd face trouble in this world. He said there'd be times we'd want to give up and seek comfort somewhere else. But Jesus also told us that he would be with us and not even death could separate us from him. He's living proof that the God of the universe is more powerful than any of the obstacles we face. The obstacles look different for each of us, but we live in a world where fear shows up unannounced and tries to steal our hope. Those are the times we have to remember the power accessible to us. Are you in a difficult time? Love will show you the way through it. I love that. Love will show you the way through it. Do you feel like you're up against seemingly unbeatable forces? Remember, love will win in the end. Our hope isn't in our ability to overcome, but in God's ability to redeem it. Think about that. And then he ends with, don't let the circumstances you're facing do all the talking. Listen to the God who already won it all with his love. I love that. The God that already won it all with his love. You know, that's the God that wants to walk with us. That's the God that wants us to sit with him. That's the God that wants us to be still in his presence. That's the God that has a battle plan that's just perfectly orchestrated for you. On our way over here, I saw a post from a friend of mine, and she had posted that her word for the year was joy. You know, for me, I needed to be still, but she needed joy. And she just thought, gosh, what a word for 2020, because that's another thing that the enemy, I think, has tried to steal, is our joy. And I just love that, and I loved what she shared, and I thought, gosh, it's just exactly what I wanted to share tonight. God gave her her battle plan for the year before it started, before some of the challenges that she was going to face hit, some of the challenges that we faced hit. So I just want to encourage you to take some time and be still and say, Lord, you know what? I've been a little distracted I've been distracted by the strife, the division, the chaos, you know, whatever it is that's been pulling on you and ask him for his battle plan because I promise you it's so good and it might look so different than what you were thinking or what you were expecting. It might be completely opposite of your personality, but I promise you it's going to be exactly what you need. You know, I really do believe that God's already been mapping out the battle plans that we need for the season that we're in right now and the seasons that are still to come. Because he knows, again, he knows exactly what we need for the season that we're in. For some of you, that you might need to take an action step. I mean, maybe you've been being still. Maybe that's been your verse since the 90s. And you're still waiting for God, but he's waiting for you. He's like, okay, now it's time to take that step. It's time to... Put your trust into action. So I just want to encourage you to embrace that. Embrace whatever he's putting on your heart to do because he loves you and he knows exactly what you need for the season you're in. I love you guys. That's what I have for you tonight. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you do have awesome, unexpected, and excited plans for us. I thank you, Father, that you haven't left us or forsaken us, that you've equipped us, that you've given us everything that we need. I thank you that we can walk forward from tonight in your strength and in your peace, that we can go clothed in your love, and that everyone that we experience will just get the overflow of your love that just pours right out of us. Father, I just lift up every person in this room. I lift up every person that's tuned in online, and I thank you, Lord, that you're providing everything that they need. I thank you that you're giving them wisdom. I thank you that you're giving them peace. I thank you that you are giving them joy in this season. I thank you, Lord, that the best is yet to come. I thank you, Father, that your goodness and your mercy, it just goes out ahead of us that it continues. I thank you, Lord, for healing. I thank you for restoration. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord. 
I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.